live yet the broadcast is live george we're live it's good to be alive it's good to be alive well um welcome everyone to the george daniel show and uh, <laughs> um you know um I, i'm not going to introduce you george because everybody knows everybody knows who you are i think but um george is george is really the the um the, the nymphing guy, I think, today, the nymphing guy for the common man, because uh, there's a lot of competition stuff. And, and George, you're really the person who's brought this stuff to the rest of us, the civilians in the population. And um, George and I did, I was lucky enough to film a TV show uh, that is that premiered Tuesday night on Real Fishing Network. And we'll also be on Saturday on World Fishing Network, but we'll, it will premiere uh, live at 9 a.m. Eastern time on YouTube on the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing and on the uh, new Fly Fisher channels. And uh, George, it was it was such an education being able to. I, I'm so people are going to be so jealous of me being able to spend two days with you basically just asking questions because I'm a terrible Euro nympha. I'm actually better now um, because I've watched this show hundred, literally hundreds of times because I had to script it and, and put the clips in the right place. So I watched them over and over and over again. And boy, I feel a lot more confident. And I think that the show is going to be a real primer on, on Euro nymphing. And uh, I'm excited for people to see it. Has anyone there in the audience um, seen the uh, the show on Real Fishing Network? Probably not. Sorry, I have to lean forward to read these uh, these comments. So uh, we're gonna take we're gonna really take questions for George. Um, George, you want to introduce the topic at all, or yeah, we're gonna. What I would love to have it is basically a discussion, kind of open-ended discussion. I mean, you know, a lot of what we do, what we're going to be talking about it is what we call European nymphing or, you know, what uh, my friends Lance and Devin would call modern nymphing. But, you know, it's, it's essentially a tight line strategy where we're not using a suspension device. We're using colored monofilament as a, as a means of, of an indicator. But the principles that we're talking about have been around ever since Hughes stuck his middle finger up to the angling world years ago and decided that, you know, fish just flies below the surface. But uh, one of the things I, I do want to point out when it comes to, like, European nymphing, there have been so many people in the past. I mean, Frank Sawyer and people in California, my mentor, Joe Humphreys, his mentor, George Harvey, a lot of them. A lot of the principles, the casting, the line control, those principles have been in place for years and will, will remain in place. But what's cool today is the technology with tools, like modern rods that we can use, the European nymphing setups, the ciders, the jig patterns, the tungsten beads. These are some of the things that I think that have elevated uh, this tight lining game even a step further uh, to, to modern day approach. All right, guys, questions. Sure, love questions. Yeah, we're waiting for them. A lot of, lot of people thanking us for doing this and saying where they're from. We got people from South Africa and I know Oklahoma and, of course, Roger Bird from Texas. Hi, Roger. Um, Max, before talking about tips on how to do it, can you talk about any situations you prefer not to tight line nymph? That's a good one. That's a really that's good great. question. There's, and that's the one thing. We developed this dogmatic approach to fly fishing. There, there's a lot of people out there that that's all they do is, is Euro nymph. And, and, and again, I, I cite my friends like Lance and Devin. I mean, those guys are great anglers, but people think of them as like fly fishing, you know, nymph nymphomaniacs, which they are. They're fantastic. But the key with good competition anglers is that you can do a little bit of everything. So a lot of the situations that I'm dealing with right now in central Pennsylvania, especially hatch, uh, match and a hatch scenarios where, you know, we've had a little bit of water, but still our streams are starting, starting to get down to kind of lower, clear conditions. And when you're fishing some of the slow, flat pools and you have fish that are eating emerging insects, you just can't get behind the fish in, in effectively tight line, even casting a long leader over a fish. 
those are situations where I think a downstream approach with a nymphing, you know, a downstream nymphing approach is going to be the most effective where you're actually locating seams and, and currents and you're just basically making short cast with say, for example, like a dry dropper. We have granums that are coming off right now, just, which is just our early season caddis. But I've been just fishing like little high vis granum CDC and elk patterns and just dropping a little soft tackle 12 inches below that, finding a likely lie that I'm going to be, you know, like I would suspect the fish to hold, putting that fly in that seam and basically just feeding slack 15, 20, 25 feet downstream, but basically allowing the indicator of the fish to fly down to the fish. Uh, also, like super windier conditions. I mean, there's places where I've been like late in the afternoon, early evening on like Silver Creek, Idaho. I mean, you get wind gusts, sometimes 35, 40 mile an hour winds over there. Same thing with like the Truckee River. I've done a bunch of clinics uh, for the Reno Fly Shop out there. That stream, that whole valley is just a wind tunnel. Uh, and there just gets to the point where there are times where the wind is just too much for you to effectively maintain some degree of control with your cider. And that's where you need to use indicator tactics and basically just let the indicator fish to fly and keeping your rod tip down low to create less of a sail for the, the wind. Uh, there's lots of questions that are going by so fast, George. I got I to gotta scroll up here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I saw one that said uh, a lot of things. Can you do this with a five weight rod? Absolutely. I mean, when I started competing, I mean, I started getting into this Euro approach probably 2004, 2005 on the competition scene. Back then, there were very few, if any, really, really good European nymphing rods. But the, the thing you need to understand is you can definitely use a five weight. You can use a traditional action fly rod for this. But the big thing that we're doing or what people are doing in, in not only competition scenes, but in, in nymphing in general, tight line nymphing is what we call fitting for the wind. And what, what that means is when you compare out a, like a traditional fly line, like a traditional fly line, like a three or a four weight fly line, this is a, a double taper three weight. I'm using on my, my H3, uh, my three weight, but a regular fly line has mass and you can do this with a traditional fly line, tight line. Nymphing, but the problem is with a lot of times when you have any line outside the rod tip, even a line that's a three weight, you can see a lot of the sag. That sag creates a counterweight, which pulls your nymphs off the bottom. So essentially what we're doing now is we're using European nymphing lines, which are very thinned out lines. This is the Orvis tactical line. I use the SA competition line. A lot of great companies make it, but you have a line that has far less mass. So the whole idea is the less mass that's outside the rod tip and even going to the point where some people are using nothing but just straight 20, 30 feet of just OX or 2X cider material. But the whole idea is that you're trying to reduce the mass outside the rod tip. The less mass you have, the straighter the line connection. Most fly rods are designed to cast fly line, 20 to 30 feet of fly line. That's how they load. That's what they're designed to do. So when you do this with a traditional five weight fly rod, you have got to really force that rod to get that rod tip to flex to cast this very thin line. You can do it, but you've got to work like hell to get that rod. What these rods are designed to do now, like the new clear water rods, new recons of two to three weight rods. These rods are designed to cast minimal amount of mass outside the rod tip. And the other thing to remember is that when you are doing this approach, this is a short range presentation where you're making cast and you're leading, cast, leading. You're doing a lot of this repetition in a short period of time. And if you're trying to do this with a five weight or a traditional action fly rod that requires a lot of force, I mean, you are going to get tired out in about an hour. So what's nice about these rods, all you need to do is just flip the wrist. These rods pretty much suck for long distance casting, but this is a short, this is a niche rod. This is a short range rod. Uh, and that's where that two or three weight rod, really these softer European nymphing tips really make your job so much easier uh, from a casting standpoint. So yes, you can use a five weight, but you're gonna find it so much more challenging to cast longer leaders. Uh, and that's the biggest complaint in uh, comment I've gotten over the years is people having issues casting these longer leaders. And it's not because they're bad casters. It's because they don't have the rod designed to cast these light systems. Yep. Okay. And then uh, Amy's asking a mono rig versus weight forward versus nymphing line. Uh, what yeah. are the, what are the, they, they all work. Now here's the thing. I mean, it's, it comes down to like, what are you going to do for the day? I mean, that, that's really what it comes down to, you know, Obviously, mono, when you talk about all mono like this, 
but these mono systems, when it, when you're talking about nymph fishing, the less mass you have in your system, the more direct line of contact, the more sensitive it is. So long story short, in my opinion, if all I'm going to do, if all I foresee myself doing in the course of a day is just nymphing, and that is it, no indicator, just simply tight line nymphing, then going mono is going to probably be your best bet because it's just going to give you the most sensitive opportunity. Right now, I like to nymph fish, but to be honest with you, I love dry flat fishing. People think of me as a nymph fisher, but if I have an <laughs> opportunity, I want to throw, I want to catch dry flats. I love dry flat fishing. So right, right now we have olives, we have some Hendrickson's, we have a few March Browns starting to pop, and we are kind of on the tail end of our granums. And because of that, I know I'm going to be nymphing for the first couple hours in the day, but probably right around 10, 30, 11 o'clock, based on a normal morning, I'm going to have some grams. I'm going to have opportunities to catch fish on the dry fly. And because of that, that's where I'm using like an Orvis tactical nymph line. This, this tactical nymph line is just a little beefier than a traditional competition line, but it's got thinned out mass. It allows you to tight line nymph, but um, on some of the recent YouTube videos I've been doing for my Penn State virtual class, I'm casting a dry fly, a, a little caddis dry fly, 35, 40 feet with this fly line. Uh, so in, in, all es in all essence, it just comes down to what you're doing. And all of a sudden, if you find yourself needing, if you're going to be fishing like a really strong wind or if you're going to find yourself indicator fishing, you know, in 30, 40 mile an hour, mile an hour not winds or fishing like a heavy indicator rig, then you can you can use a, a three weight uh, double taper, a three weight board. Uh, so I I use all three to be honest with you. I use the mono, I use the euro lines, and then I also use traditional taper lines. But it really comes down to what I plan on doing for that day. And most mm -hmm. of the people who fish waters over and over again have a good feel for what's going to be happening. I'm not saying streams are overly predictable, but if you have the gist of what's going on during the time of the year and season. You should have a general idea of what you can expect. Uh, for the day and that's how you plan your your line and your, your systems okay um there's a question i think that came in from instagram what orvis setup do you recommend for entry level fly fisher for this technique so to keep it simple what i would recommend is just using like an orvis so using a 10 foot three orvis clear water if you're looking just to get into this like a, a 10 foot three orvis clear water i would use the orvis tactical fly line and off that orvis tactical fly line I tend to build my own leaders. 10 foot three weight, uh, clear water, the tactical nymph line, and off this leader, all I have is basically four feet of 15 pound test maxima. And again, this is just what I use. There are so many systems, but four feet of 15 pound test maxima. I have a short section of cider, about 20 inches of OXSA or Orvis you know, tactical cider material. I have a tippet ring off the end of my cider. And then it's just level four or five feet of say, you know, 4X or 5X. But the thing that you need to remember, if you're just getting into this, you don't need really a taper of a, of a leader because basically you are casting weighted flies or a weighted rig where the weight of the rig itself is going to help propel it forward. You're not relying on the taper of the line. So thinning out the leader, uh, that four feet of 15 pound test maxima, short 20 inch section of cider and a tipper ring, and then just level tip it below that. That is, is really all you need. And you can keep this incredibly simple. Uh, you don't have to complicate this at all. And uh, uh, people can also buy cider leaders from Orvis if they don't want to make them. But uh, the, the cool thing about a cider leader is you got the tippet ring on the end and that's uh, you're going to use that cider leader. You could use it for years. I'm still using the cider leader you made <laughs> for me a year and a half ago when we filmed on the Farmington uh, yeah. with because it you know i didn't need to change it i yeah. just changed the tippet at the tippet ring so yeah and for those who don't know the tippet ring i mean it's it, all it is just a little micro ring built at the end of your leader but like tom was saying what, what's so nice about the tippet rings is every time with traditional surgeon's knots when anytime you're attaching tippet onto your leader you're always connecting the two pieces and you always have a tag to cut off and in essence you're essentially cutting back on your leader but with the tippet rings all you're doing is doing your favorite tippet knot from there to the ring. So you never cut back on a leader. And in Pennsylvania, I'm sure is in, in like where you're at in Vermont, it's not very sunny. You know, like we are like one of the top 12 or 13 cl cloudiest areas in the lower 48 in Pennsylvania. We don't have a lot of sunlight. So as a result, what that allows, my leaders will last me eight, nine months before the UV breaks it down. My friends that go out and they fish in California or Colorado, they're getting like 280 days of sunlight every year. 
And as a result, their leaders are going to last them a little less longer because the amount of UV coming in and breaking down the, the monofilament and the and dulling and basically tweaking out the cider color, making it duller. Oh, man, it duller because the, the, uh, the cider material is OX, so it's not the strength you worry about. It's the color that bleaches out. Huh? Right. Correct. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, do jig flies, Jordan wants to know, do jig flies really make a difference? And I don't know if you if you read Dom's post recently uh, where he talked about the fact that all weighted flies ride upside down and the jig flies. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't use I mean, I use jig hooks because I think they look pretty good. I like the hook points. I think you I, I like the competition style hooks, basically, mm -hmm. because of the hook point. But I mean, yeah, this is uh, Dom hit, hit the nail on the head. And then this is this is basic. You know, Trout Tactics 101 from Joe Humphreys back in 78 when he wrote his book on Trout Tactics. But usually when you weigh any weighted fly, you look at it, it's going to ride upside down. Uh, so, yeah, I I don't necessarily buy the, buy into the jig hooks just, you know, to invert the hook. If I really wanted to do that, you can weight any style hook and it's going to invert. But, again, I use the jig style hooks just because I love those long needle. Uh, and then also – I, I'm very lazy on a lot, uh, a lot of points where a lot of times when I'm tying flies, if there it's a barbed fly, there's so many times I forget to debarb the fly before I take it out to the stream. So I use those competition hooks just because they're basically barbless, and I do like the finer points on them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, something that, that people ask me all the time, and I'm sure you agree, is that there there's no such thing as a, a competition or a tight lining nymph versus a standard nymph. I tie... I tie a bunch of nymphs, and whether I tie them in jig hooks or not, I, I do both. Yep. And I use them for indicators, or I use them naked with, you know, just with a floating line, not tight lining, but floating right. line, swinging them. And I use the same flies. It, does, it doesn't matter. You use them interchangeably, right? right. As long as yeah. they're weighted. Yeah, there's there's no thing like competition standard. They're they're all nymphs to me. Yeah. yeah, you can use them. You can use them everywhere. Uh, Jamie wants to know, how do you determine leader length and what is your maximum range when fishing Euro technique? That's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, again, personal preference. Streamed, one of the things is canopy. Uh, you know, it's not when people talk about small streams. I mean, you can have small streams. I fish in the driftless area, which are about yay wide, but they're in open fields and you have lots of overhead space. And I'll fish a 30 foot leader on a small stream with overhead, with plenty of overhead space. The number one factor for me is just how much room do I have casting room above me and into the sides. So normally I'm fishing really, sh you know, short leaders, maybe in a short leader for me might be eight to 10 feet when I'm doing this in really small, tight, small mountain streams. Uh, but in all honesty, I try to go as long as a leader as possible uh, in most situations, because the more line and leader or the, the more leader I have out, the less line I have outside the rod tip and just the more, area i'm able to keep line leader off the water so uh, i go incredibly long to the point where when there are streams like in low clear water in central pennsylvania where i don't want to put any line on the water whatsoever say july august a lot of times my my mono rigs basically are anything from like 30 to 35 feet in length so i can literally present the fly 40 45 feet away given that you have a 10 foot rod and 30 foot leader outside the rod to you can hold 40 feet of fly line off or leader off the water and present the flies without making or reducing the amount of impact landed on the water. Mm -hmm. um, somebody wanted to ask if you don't want to invest in a setup right now, you want to try this. Yeah. Um, what would you do? I would recommend that you just put a really long leader on there and, and keep the fly line inside the guides, right? Yeah, that's it. That's all you really need to do. I mean, you can just basically just put, you know, 40 feet of, or a whole spool of Maxima tippet, you know, to a tippet, you know, to a cider. And then off of that. So absolutely just or even just strand. Go go to a Cabela's and just buy strand 30, 30, you know, 40 yards of just gold strand and just run a tipper ring off of that. So, yeah, you don't need to invest uh, heavily in this. But I, I guarantee you anyone there's been there's been very few people that have gotten into this uh, and they've seen the effectiveness of this that decided not to go, you know, to, you know, to kind of disregard it. So this is a, a good technique. And I can almost say about 95% of the people who I've seen get into this stick, it, uh, stick to it just because of its, I think, effectiveness. But then too, it is a very simple technique. This is not complicated. When you look at like indicator tactics where you're casting, putting line leader on the water, and you're making the men, 
in my opinion, indicator tactics is one of the most sophisticated, most complicated forms of, of nymph fishing. Here, we're just casting lob and weights usually, keeping the rod tip high and just leading the fly. So it's a much simpler form uh, of fishing. Um, do you Euro small streamers? If so, is there anything you do differently from traditional nymphing? Absolutely. I mean, that's one of the that's one of my first clips I did for Penn State. So I I love uh, digging streamers. So one of the things you know, again, this is this is nothing new, and I think, but we have you know, there's always a couple of little. Everyone's got their own spin on things, but you know, Joe Humphreys was fishing flat mono back in the '50s and '60s. Uh, but a lot of things I'm doing is when you think about streamer fishing, I love casting streamers. I love stripping them. I love working them. I love swimming my flies and having fish follow. But I think streamer fishing is no different than nymph fishing. And like what you know, people say, what the difference between a good nymphing day and a bad nymphing day is usually like one split shot. And the same thing is true with streamers. I love fishing streamers, but there are days when those fish are not willing to chase. You've got to put the food closer to them. And that's is where like a mono rig, where basically you're tight lining. Basically, in essence, instead of putting line on the water and stripping it, the more line that's on the water, the more surface tension, the more drag, and the quicker your flies move it. Here, we're basically tight lining this casting. We're using heavily weighted jig flies, like a little Crelix pattern or something similar. But I will work these flies. I will drift them. But also, a lot of times what I'm doing is with these, these Euro rods, what I love about this, and this is right out of the Tenkara playbook, we talked about this when we were doing our last uh, podcast, Tom, is because these rod tips have su such a soft tip, all I'm going to do is often when I'm actually leading my flies and I'm casting up and just kind of dead drift them, I'm just going to take my index finger and just tap that cork, and that just sends a shock wave up the leader, down to the cider, and into the flies. And you'll see this thing. Even though it's drifting, you'll see that twitch, that this tail. You'll, you'll just see it flash, just basically reflecting light. And one of the things I think is so good about jigging streamers is that you are imitating a dead, dying, or wounded bait fish. So often when you are working streamers where you're casting and actually actively retrieve them, you are, you are imitating something that still has a chance to escape. And, and, and sometimes trout don't, they're lazy sometimes, especially the largest fish. They don't want to have to chase. They want the food to come to them. And by really being able to slow down your presentation, I really think that sends off the, the, tri the trigger or the dinner bell in the fish's head saying, this is something that's going to be very easy for me to grab, and I'm going to grab it. Uh, so I, I love fishing jig streamers. And the one thing I will point out when you're doing this with jig streamers is, is, is the idea that you can use from like the soft plastics like the bass anglers have been using for years. Some of my original patterns I used for jig and streamers were made of wool and rabbit. And my original concept with that is that material is going to absorb water and it's going to help sink the fly, which it does. But the thing you need to remember is that when these fish hit this jig streamer, you're moving the fly. You're, it's a slow drift. It's like a nymphing drift. These fish are not going to just come out of the woodwork and hammer your flies. When you're working streamers actively and you're swimming them and you're, you're stripping them, you are moving those flies through a fast speed. When a fish strikes, you're going to feel that pull. But with this, these takes are often very subtle. And when I'm working the streamer, I don't want to feel like I'm pulling a wet sock through the water column. And that's exactly the feel you get when you're trying to pull a, a big bunny fly or a big wool fly. So I'm looking at any material that's more water phobic, something that's going to shed water. So when I pull this through the water column with that rod tip, it's like a plastic. I can feel every time that fly moves and dives. And when the mm -hmm. fish breaks, you're just going to feel that resistance. Just It's just a, a touch. And I find that these types of flies, whether it's all flash synthetics or even like patterns like marabou, which are natural but have a, a water phobic property to it, it's just going to give you a heightened sense of sensitivity. So that's my two cents on jigging streamers. Oh, that's great. Do you have to strike harder because of that soft rod tip when you're jigging streamers? That's, that's a great point. Here's the thing. Yes, yes, you absolutely need to because in, this is where your your hook point, I think, and this is why like with all my streamers, Tom, that I'm fishing with, with this approach is because often I'm doing this with a three weight and, and like softer rod tips. When you when you set the hook with that, because you're not like stri you're not strip setting most of the time, you know, you're not creating straight force. You're using the rod tip, and because of that, because of these long rods that have these little, really soft, limber tips, you have really often got to put a lot of force into it. And the other thing is your hook is so important with this, and this is why I'm using nothing but basically competition style hooks, very thinned out points. Because with traditional style streamer hooks, you have a heavier gauge wire, and because of that. 
you have got to put so much force. And when you're using a strip set, that's perfectly fine. But if you're trying to use your standard like Gamagatsus and some of these larger partridge style hooks, I just can't get a good hook set with those soft limber tips. So that's when I'm, whenever I'm jigging streamers, I go with a very thin light wire point. It's a sacrifice. Yes, you can bend it. You can kind of dull this hook point out once in a while if you hit over too many rocks. But you're going to find, I, I believe, your hooks percentage, your hook set percentage is going to be so much better by going to these competition style hooks when you're jigging. Otherwise, it's just, it's, it's just almost impossible to get a good secure hook set. So that would be like that Orvis 60 degree jig hook? Exactly. Yeah. And also yeah. larger sizes, like, you know, yeah. like a 12, but absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, how about some key points to tight line nymphing in skinny water? Yeah. So one of the things with tight line nymphing is in skinny water is usually in skinnier water, you're talking maybe riffles, you know, skinny fish that are in those water. What's a good thing for that for us is fish that are in those skinny waters. They're in there usually for one reason only, and that is to feed. Uh, the other fish that might be in there on, at times situations might be the smaller fish that have gotten kicked out of the primary spots. But for the most part, the larger fish, the medium sized fish that are in those skinny waters are in there to feed. So when I'm, when I'm fishing, this is where I'm fishing very lightly weighted flies. Like the, the local spring Creek that I fish, it's called spring Creek, but the average depth of that water is probably maybe a foot, foot and a half at the most. And there's a lot of sections like in July and August which might even, I mean, I'm nymphing water that's maybe five or six inches in depth. It's it's pretty shallow stuff. And this is where I'm fishing single lightly weighted flies, patterns like a simple, like little SOS. This is a size 16 with a, a three with a 30 millimeter bead, or not a 30, uh, a 20 millimeter bead, but just very lightly weighted flies. The key there when you're fishing skinny water and with lightweight flies, it really comes down to thinning out your leader. So what I mean by that is this is all the weight I'm going to use in my rig. That is it. And when you think of when you think about this, and this is what you need to conceptualize, if you're standing in fast moving water, even in water that's about ankle height, and you have a fly, and this has happened to me a couple times this year. You know, we had the sucker spawn run, and you have a high vis color like egg pattern. And all of a sudden, like your hands get cold, my hands get cold, and you accidentally drop it. And you're thinking you're going to see that thing just get swept all the way down the stream, but it doesn't. The thing basically drops right to your feet because there's nothing there's no nothing attached to it and there's no drag. It's allowed to free drop. When you're fishing small flies on skinny water, one of the things you want to do is you want to conceptualize the thought that you need to drift your flies. You need to let the current actually drift the flies for you. And all you are doing as the angler is just staying ahead of it with the rod tip. When you have a traditional action fly line, this is where I will not use, this is where I'm basically using all mono because when you have a standard action fly line like this off the rod tip, this sag right here that you're seeing, there's enough weight right here that it's going to pull those lightly weighted flies out. But if you're taking a system, like I might take my entire leader, might be just 20 feet of like say OX or 2X cider from Orbis or SA, this is it. This will be my entire leader, just basically 20 feet of this to a tippet ring, to a very short section of tippet. And because of this, there's no mass, it doesn't pull your flies off the bottom. And in essence, you can drift these flies, and this is all the weight you're going to need because there's absolutely no counter pull lifting these flies out of the water. And when you're drifting these flies, the key with this is you need to think about drifting your flies like a dry fly. And because you have so little mass, when the fish strikes, you don't have like, it's not like you have a heavily weighted jig fly right here pulling down and creating tension. When the fish strikes, because there, there's a lot of weight here and it's basically a straight line under tension, when the fish strikes, you're going to feel that. You're not going to do that with these lighter weight flies. When you're fishing lightweight flies in skinny water, 99% of the times, maybe 95% of the times, you're going to feel, you're going to see the strike. And this is where all you're doing is just watching that cider. And what's beautiful about the soft lint material that all these companies make today is that when you're drifting, all you're looking for is just that right there. This that that twitching, stopping, the moment that line twi stops twitching, you're immediately going to set your hook. And because you're fishing your flies so lightly weighted and they're drifting, nine times out of ten when that line stops, it's because of a fish and not snagging the bottom if you have your weights dialed in. Mm -hmm. But Great. In, yeah, skinny water, really lighten up your load uh, when it comes to uh, your rig. 
There's a couple questions about um, uh, leading the fly and should my rod dip and cider be ahead of or behind my flies? And can you talk about fly speed? I'm not sure what it means to lead my fly through the drift. Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's all jargon, different types of language, but. So let, give me, yeah, give me a, a second here. So if you have a second here, Tom, let me just do a, a mock rig right here real quick with the cider. Cause this is an, an important part because I think one of the, I think the mistake I made growing up tight line nymphing was I was always taught to lead the flies and it wasn't always kind of clearly broken down to me what the heck that meant. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in, 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 in all truth, in the matter, matter of the truth was to be told, I think so often most anglers, including myself early on, lead the flies too much. And let me explain this. Because the whole idea with tight line nymphing and the whole idea with your nymphs, again, just conceptualize thinking about comparing your, your fishing your nymph just like you would a dry fly. You can drag your nymphs, and there are sections of water like pocket water and so forth where you can drag a dry fly. You're still going to get fish to eat the surf, you know, on the surface. Same thing with nymphing. There are times where you can drag a nymph, and the fish are still going to eat. But most of the time, what we're trying to do, especially in these hard-pressure fisheries, is trying to get the flies to drift naturally. And the other part here is this. Use your steps, George. I know. This is job for my dentist. <laughs> your dentist could be watching, George. <laughs> Let me get back here a little bit. So when I made <laughs> that, you can see there's a mop for high vis. I have a short section of tippet to my, my colored mono, but here's the thing. When you when you begin to cast and you begin leaning, the moment the flies land in the water, what happens so often is you immediately want people to talk about leading the flies. So you can lead the flies, but what happens is the further this Raw tip is downstream. You see the angle right here. It's a pretty shallow angle. But in essence, the further this rod tip is down from my flies, the higher the, the degree of tension that's on my rig. So if you're fishing fast in your pocket water, you just going to want to pull your flies a little bit faster, that's fine. But when you're trying to drop your flies and get them down fast, one of the things you want to do is think about fishing vertically, basically underneath the rod tip. And what happens is when that rod tip begins pulling downstream on the flies, these flies are not able to free fall. What I want is when you look at this fly right here, if I was to drop it, it's going to drop quick and drop fast. So fish in skinny pocket water, things like that, you can begin leading the flies immediately. But what's cool about the tight line system, as you know, Tom, is that when you go from skinny water to deeper water and you want your flies to drop, all you need to do is just relax the tension. So I can lead the flies, but as soon as I go into that drop off, what I'm going to simply do is just, instead of moving the rod tip downstream, I'm simply going to elevate the rod tip further upstream. What that elevation does, it as the drift still moves downstream, the flies keep moving. We need to manage that slack, but instead of managing the slack by moving it downstream, putting tension, all I'm going to do is by managing the slack is just elevating the rod tip. So I have basically decreased tension, and this these flies now are going to drop quickly. And once they drop, what we're looking for is for that cider, as long as you can get close to your target, to basically fish them under the rod tip. And once you get this cider vertical, those flies are no longer under tension. Basically, you think about the rod tip like an indicator. You are just holding them and suspending them. And if you're fishing skinny water, you know, you're gonna hold the cider a little bit higher off the water. If you're not getting down deep enough, you can lower it. Uh, but the whole idea, I think the thing I've been doing most recently in the last couple of years is learning to try to fish as vertical off the rod tip as possible. Because people always wanna talk about leading the flies and that is, the reason why we end up having to use so much split shot, so much weight. If you can get these flies to drop directly underneath the rod tip, you're decreasing the tension and you will be surprised how little weight you really need to fish lighter weight flies, even in fast turbulent water. Uh, Paul wants to know, and we have, we have some really good stuff on this in the TV show, but a lot of people haven't seen it yet. Wants to know about casting tips. And yeah. I know you've got a lot of great, you really, you really improved my Euro casting skills which were pretty poor when we started out no no we, we all start some somewhere and, and you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're being a little too kind or a little hard on yourself there tom <laughs> in in essence what we can do is one of the things with with weighted flies the way you can look at it is this when you're using heavily weighted flies 
one of the things that we need to understand when you're casting weighted flies is basically a 180 degree rule. So meaning that when I have a heavily weighted fly or a heavily weighted stream or whatever it is, I want where on my wherever I want to make my cast, my forward cast, those flies have got to be basically in a straight line. For the most part, before I begin my cast stroke, I'm trying to pull them through a straight line. What happens when you're fishing really heavy anchor flies, big heavy rigs, for the most part, if you come straight back hard and that weight, that heavily weighted fly comes back, it's going to often kick or jerk, and it's going to kick off and jerk off to the other side. And as a result, because those flies kicking off the side, when you make your forward strap, it's going to go off candy quarter. It's not always going to be as accurate. So one of the things you can do when you're casting really heavily weighted flies is just using a, a cast, what we call an oval cast, but it's just a circular cast where instead of coming straight back and stop and getting those flies to jerk, we're just basically keeping the flies under the rod. You're keeping control the entire time. You're just swinging the flies around and you're reducing the kickback. And once the flies swing around behind you, you can just simply make your forward casting stroke. On the other hand, when you're working small flies, and this is, I think, for me, everyone's got their own styles about casting, but if I'm using a mono rig that's 30 feet in length, that's level tippet, and it's small, light way of fly, I don't have much help in the out right here. And I think the best way to cast lightly way of flies is like the idea of a straight plane. The straighter the plane, the more speed I can create. The moment I go into a curve, I'm going to slow things down. With lighter weight, super lightly weighted flies, I want my flies to move in a sh straight plane. So when I'm fishing sh very lightly weighted flies on a long leader, typically I'm making very short, straight, compact motions. I want to move straight because I can create speed that direction. The moment I start curving or twisting my shoulders, I'm going to lose speed, and you're not going to be able to effectively cast lighter weight flies. So heavily weighted flies kind of coming around the oval cast, absorbing the shock. But lighter weight flies, it's more short, compact casting strokes. And the one thing I will say about with this whole rig, with, with casting in general, with with this whole system, I do maybe, maybe well, before this year, uh, I did like 120 lessons a year on basic, basically specifically Euro fishing. But the whole idea with tight line nymphing, European nymphing, is you want your cider visible from the very start. And what happens so often, I can – I've watched thousands of hours of GoPro footage. I've watched people fish. I can tell immediately when they're going to basically duck their cast and put it in the water. And what happens nine times out of ten for beginner casters when they're doing this, they look down the water, and what do they do? They take their rod tip and they put down the water. And when you put that rod tip down the water, you bury your cider in the water. You can't see it. What you want to do, in my opinion, is that when you're casting on your back cast, all we're doing is just remembering we're going to start low and we're going to finish high. Start low, finish high, but that means at the end of the cast and stroke, when you start, when you make your presentation cast, you stop it and you hold it. When you hold it at that height, when those, fly, when that, when those flies land, that slider is immediately in your vision, right from the very start. So shoulders up, look out, aim up. Don't look down and bury down because when you bury that slider on the water, you can't see it, and then you have a knee-jerk reaction. You want to jerk the rod tip up. And you pull the cider back and you pull the flies back off the water. And by the time the flies reset, the drift is over. So just starting low, aiming high, sticking it uh, is probably one of the best tips I can give you for that. That was the biggest revelation to me was I, I was casting as I would cast a normal fly rod and end at 10 or and then follow through nine. And then, oh, I got to raise my rod and you're done. Right. It's already, as you said, it's already passed. So stopping that rod tip high letting the flies drop into the water and then immediately uh, following the cider was was what made a difference, big difference for me. Absolutely. And one point further, if you don't mind, Tom, uh, but the whole thing here is having this under control. You know, again, I work with a lot of folks, but when you see people casting, a lot of times if you see people casting, turning their shoulders, dropping their shoulders, you'll see this line leader create slack right from the very beginning. So one of the things you want to think about when you're making this cast is, and that's the beautiful thing about these European nymphing style rods. They require very little force. All it is is just a flip of the wrist to make the cast. And what I want, as soon as I'm making my cast, it's like it's what I call throwing darts, but as soon as I make my cast, I want to see that tighter, that cider just nice and tight right from the very beginning. But if I make a cast and I continue to turn my shoulders or rotate or drop my shoulders, I'm immediately putting slack in that cast. So with this cast, it is nothing more than just a flip of the wrist. And when you make, when you reduce your body movement, and you do nothing but the flip of the wrist and aiming high, that line and leader is going to lay out nice and tight from the very beginning. 
And what is so cool about this approach compared to like indicator tactics, I know we talked about this on the video, is that when you're making a cast with an indicator tactic, when, those, when the indicator lands and the fly lands, there's often a disconnect as those flies drop. But with this technique, it's like bass fishing. You can make a cast and you can basically fish the flies on the drop. So you have control the moment the flies land as long as you make a nice tight cast from the very beginning. So it allows you to fish flies on the fall. And right now when we have hatches, our granums, salt, or our granums, our olives, and uh, some of our smaller stone flies, these fish are on high alert. They're actually taking insects or flies as they're dropped into the water column. Something I think a lot of times I missed with former uh, indicator approaches. Well, we're never going to get to all the questions, I don't think. All of a sudden, uh, I notice <laughs> millions of questions. Uh, I'm trying to get to trying to get to where we left off. <laughs> um, try to get the ones that are a little more pertinent to the subject. Do you, oh, here's a good one. Um, do you fish mostly directly upstream with the line ending right under the rod tip, or do you fish up and across with the cider? angled slightly away from you? Well, there's situational, but uh, I mean, with my, I guess my limited view, the way I look at things is <clears throat> your angle presentation is incredibly important. So normally like right in the winter time or periods where there's low child activity, I'm thinking about more drifting slower and deeper. And when you're casting more in line, parallel to the flow of water, you keep your flies down deeper and you put less tension on them. You allow your flies to stay longer, down deeper, longer. This is the time of the year, again, in central PA right now, this is like prime hatch time. So this is the time when insects are hatching, fish are actually looking up for the food as well, not only on the drift, but also on the swung presentation. So for now, for like the next two months here, during our prime activity, and this is when the fish are usually on the highest alert, I tend to fish more up and across. So by doing that up and across, up across, up and across approach, I can cast upstream. I can allow my flies to drift a little bit, but more importantly, what I'm doing is setting myself up for the swung presentation, where I can drift a little bit. I can put the brakes on it, and I can get those flies to lift upward. And I would say, like right now, like in the last couple of days, I've been fishing, especially during the granums. I would say over half my strikes occurred on the swung presentation. So it comes down to seasonality, usually kind of straight up when I want to go deep, longer, deeper, but I'll cast more up and across any time where I'm trying to drift and then set myself up for the, the swung presentation. Um, yeah, there's a lot of really general questions here that I think um, I think all of you, if you're able to watch this um, uh, broadcast today, get YouTube. So I would recommend that some of these really general questions that you um, – that tune into the, the TV show on YouTube on Saturday morning. Um, here's a good one though, that, that we, the, that I'm sure you get a lot from Herbie. What's the benefit of tying my flies on tags rather than off the hook? Like I would normally nymph. Yeah. So that, that's a great question. I mean, there's still a lot of people that still tie flies off the bend, but I will say for one thing, personally, I would say anytime you're tying off the bend of a fly, it almost creates like a weed guard effect to the point where I think a lot of times fish come up, they eat the fly that <clears throat> that almost uh, it reduces the chance of me actually setting the hook. I, I end I end up foul hooking so many fish uh, on situations where, like on a dry dropper, I tie a, a nymph off the dry. The fish comes up, hits the dry fly, and basically it just creates like a guard. It won't allow the and then you basically set the hook and then you you snag it on the top of the head with the back. And the same thing happens when you're fishing double nymph rigs. So. The one thing is I think you're going to get far less foul hooks. And then two, especially when you're fishing droppers, uh, and this is one of the most important parts, I think, is that. Well, also, if you're fishing barbless hooks, sometimes that, that dropper fly will slide off the hook. Correct. Exactly. <laughs> and, you, and it's gone. And the other thing I, I love, and, and usually everyone's got their own rigs, but whether you're using like a bottom bouncing rig where you're putting lots of split shot on the bottom, or if you are – fishing even a heavily weighted Euro fly on the point and you're just fishing off the dropper, you know, usually my, my approach to fishing is this. When I'm fishing a single, if it's early in the day and there's not much activity, I'm almost always just fishing one fly. By fishing two flies, most of the time, all I feel like I'm doing is just doubling my chances to 
uh, increased tangles and whatnot. But the time I actually add a dropper is when I find that the fish are actually going to be looking up in the water column. And when you have a heavily weighted fly on the point, whether it's a, a split shot or a heavily weighted anchor fly, that shot or that fly is going to be hidden and ticking bottom. What that is doing, again, it, it's sending shock waves up the leader. And if you have a lighter, unweighted fly on this dropper, I think it actually animates a fly. It gives the fly a lot more motion. So not only that on the drift, but also on the swung presentation when you're swinging out your flies, I will almost always have some sort of soft tackle pattern here on the top where I can swing this out and just let the currents just kind of play with it. And I can hold it and suspend it uh, right in the column. So less hookups. And by far, I think it's a far more natural presentation uh, to the fish, especially with soft tackle yeah. mergers. And it doesn't really tangle as much as you would suspect. No, and that's that's a great point because when it comes to the casting, like when I started teaching my kids at age four, we were going out to like the Madison River when they were four and five years old. And for the first couple of years, they knew that mommy and daddy, you know, when they got tangled, you know, we were going to help them out. But like age seven, seven, eight, seven or eight, like once they got tangled, they were going to be sitting on the banks for about a half hour until I, I got my, until I finally found my way to help them out. And one of the things with casting, I'm going to explain here is this, when you're casting, one of the biggest mistakes, this is what we all do. We make a cast, we cast upstream, we lead, we lead, we lead. And at the end of the presentation, after we swing out the flies, this is what all of us do. We all of a sudden we cast and turn simultaneously. And when you do that, that sends a kick in that line of leader. You get tangled. And then the other thing is when you go from a when you turn and cast simultaneously, if there's any vegetation, anything on the bank, you're in, you're gonna you're gonna kick the flies off to the bank. You're gonna get tangled. So one of the things I just taught my kids, and it's something I do, I have to repeat in my head when I get excited, is when you cast, you're going to cast, you're going to lead, 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 let the hook, let the fly swing out, but you're always going to reposition first, keep the rod tip cocked back, and then make them a cast. But all you are doing is just reducing the tangles or reducing the jerk, you know, on, on the cast. So by just smoothly putting things up, it's going to be a lot easier. And the same thing with your hook set. When you make a hook set, when you're leading the flash throughout the presentation, all of a sudden I take my wrist, I snap my wrist up or, or snap the wrist up to set the hook. When those flies exit the water, they're going to go back out of the water and they're going to catapult and they're going to kick on themselves. So often when you're tight line nymph and you watch like the really good nymph anglers that get very few tangles, when they lead, they lead, all they're doing is just sliding their hand downstream. That's all it is. They're not pulling the flies out of the water because when you pull the flies out of the water, you're going to do two things, like blind chocolate, my friend always says, you don't want to hunt squirrels because you kick the flies out, you're going to kick the flies high in the water, very likely into the trees, but also you're going to reduce that, uh, that, that kickback. So when you think about setting the hook, just think about moving that fly two, three inches fast, uh, down, you know, in line, downstream of the current, but try not to pull the flies out of the water, just slide them fast downstream. And if you do those two things, just smooth cast and that smooth hook set, that's like 90%, in my opinion, of your problems when it comes to tangles. Those are great tips. Those are great tips. Um, Jennifer wants to know, curious about floating the cider. How do you actually float the cider? Does this make the cider more like a traditional strike indicator? Situations you use this technique, and what size tungsten bead would you use? That's, that's a good question. So let me just take a look here. We have – here we go. So a couple things I'm going to do is anytime I'm floating the cider and what, what you need to understand is this, it has limitations. You know, there are times where you need to use a large indicator, like a balloon style indicator where you have a lot of weight. When I'm using this cider is when I'm intending, when I'm intentionally trying to drift very lightly weighted flies, very shallow. So maybe I'm fishing skinny water or if I'm fishing, the spinner fall, like, you know, the sulfur spinners where you, you're fishing below a rift where those spinners get chopped under and you're basically fishing a sunken spinner, maybe a couple of inches below the water. This is where this basically grease leader is going to work really well. There's a couple of things I like to do. One is if you're going to do a grease leader, I prefer to use like the OX or like larger diameter ciders. The larger the diameter, it's going to give you more surface area and therefore more buoyancy. And the other thing you can do is you know, a lot of people don't like them, but I, I love these little bunny ears. These little ears, and what I'll do is just a blood knot every so in, so many inches on my leader, but it gives you a little more visibility. But what this allows you to do, it allows you, when you're using grease, 
uh, and I don't use a I don't use a gel. What I'm doing is I'm using like like the old school mucilin. You know, Orbis has this. This is a loon payout paste, but anything similar to that. But you're going to take this paste and you're going to just really just pack in that grease on that leader. And those nuts allow you to pack in more grease and therefore add floatability to your leader. And when you're doing this, what's so nice about this 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 system when you make a cast. When you make this cast with a cider, and also my tippet is only going to be about two feet. I'm not, I'm not using a long section of tippet. I'm just basically this is like a dry. Think about this like a dry dropper, where you're just dripping a dropping a lighter weight nymph off a dry fly, just 12, 14, 20 inches or so, but just a short section. And all we're doing is just laying that cider on the water. The other thing I like about the cider, the the these this these blood knots here, what I call bunny ears is that nine times out of 10, when you make a cast the correct way, you can see how these ears staying straight up in the air. So it gives you a tip top indicator that you can see from a distance, even regular colored monofilament. When you're fishing it flush on the film, sometimes you can disappear, but, but by simply having these ears, you can see this a lot better from a distance. Uh, but all of this, most of the time, it's just a straight up line presentation. And the thing here to remember is you don't always have to be super straight. What I like to do intentionally even is just throw a little bit of slack. And you'll just see the softer monofilament just kind of drifting in the water. And then the moment you just see it begin to just tighten up is going to be your cue to set the hook. And the thing to remember is you're just fishing, usually with a system like this, I'm not fishing a bead any heavier than like a 332nd or like a, I'm not sure what that is, like a 2.5 millimeter bead. Uh, so it's pretty lightweight flies. And usually when I'm doing this system in really skinny water, I'm not even using any tungsten beads. I'm usually using a brass bead uh, because I'm, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to just basically break the surface tension and just mm -hmm. fit a couple inches below the surface, especially, mm -hmm. especially during summers when you're fishing like sunken ants and your sunken terrestrials like green weenies. You don't want to go super deep in my opinion. You kind of want to just basically break that surface tension. And that's where a system like this, I think, is just excels and just gives you a much stealthier presentation than, say, a bobber or even like a large mm -hmm. dry fly. Yeah. And Dave Jensen, never mind about tip sag. You're the one with tip sag. <laughs> that's a private joke. Uh, we're getting to some repetitive questions. I'm going to move past them. And, you know, people want to know basic tips for starting. Um, again, we can't uh, can't go over everything again. If you had to switch to a lighter leader when using a Euro line, do you attach the new one with nail knot or do you have extra spools? So say that again, Tom. I'm just. If you have to switch to a lighter leader, I, I guess if you're going to a Euro line do you attach the new one with the nail knot or do you have extra spools personally i i have a loop on the end of my leaders and i just loop it to the fly line loop to loop connection yeah you can i don't, do know, I don't know about you but typically like when i'm when i'm fishing off like a euro line uh, i'm going to use the same line for dry flies and nymphs and what i'm doing off of this system is this is four feet of 15 pound test maxima i actually have a little micro ring off of that so what i'm going to do is off that leader i have my my cider if i want to switch to a dry fly i have my cider and my leader up to my flies, I'm gonna take some sort of like cartridge where I'm gonna take this cartridge and I will just basically just wind this all the way up to the top tippet ring right here, cut that cider off, and then I had the tippet ring still on my base of my leader, and then I already have a short section of tapered, say 2X mono to like 5X mono to my drive fly already on my cartridge. So uh, that's, but yeah, everyone's got their systems, but I, just, I tend to kind of really just, have one base, one leader base, and then I just kind of work off of that with different systems already rigged on a cartridge. But you have you have loops on the end of your leaders, right? I don't use loops. Oh, um, you don't. Use, okay. I don't. I don't. Just mm -hmm. because I don't change leaders that much, and because I have that tipper ring, and I never cut back on my leader. Uh, the other thing is just when you're doing this approach, sometimes, in my opinion, sometimes with these, even if I decide to use a shorter leader. Part of this nail, this this connection, if you have a loop to loop connection, especially with a long leader and you're stripping in line, so often that connection is going to be going to the tip top guides. So as a result, anytime I anticipate myself ever having to strip in lead or line that connection to the tip top, I'm almost always going to use a nail knot. And I'm going to also coat that with like super glue or like a UV resin, just kind of smooth that out so there's no bump uh, during the strip. 
But if you're using shorter leaders in that line, that tip of that fly line is always outside the rod tip, then the loop is a great idea because I think loops are, are, are great on most instances, especially if you're fishing like traditional dry flies. And when you want the when you want the fly line to float and you use that for like indicator tactics, I think one of the worst things you can do to a traditional weight forward or a double taper fly line is actually cutting the the loop off of that if you intend to actually fish put it on the surface because all you're doing is you're decreasing the surface or that that buoyancy. The fly yeah. line tips are great for connection, but also fly line tips, as you know, help the, the, the fly line float. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Um, here's a good question from Charles. Um, because we have a, uh, the new recon has both a two weight and a three weight Euro rod, um, benefits and drawbacks of each. Cause you you helped us design both of those, right? Yeah. So a couple things I would say, I've gotten this question like a couple times this week already. I was mm. three weight. Both of them were designed specifically for like European, uh, techniques in mind. I would say the three weight is still a little more versatile, meaning that if you want to put a, a three weight fly line on, like a traditional fly line, and actually cast it, the three weight still has got the backbone. You can do that. You can cast dry flies with it. The two weight, it is a limp rod. It is a super limp rod, uh, and it's great. Super, and it's incredibly sensitive, and it makes casting very lightly mono rigs and like European nymphing lines so much easier. Uh, but in my opinion, you can't really do anything else with that two weight. It is really, truly a nymphing rod. Where the three weight, you if you're going to be doing some other techniques, you've got some flexibility with that rod. Okay, great, great explanation. Thank you, George. Uh, Andy asks, would you recommend starting with jig hooks to focus on technique more and less on hooking bottom? Well, we kind of talked about that in that the jig flies don't, hang up th that much less than any weighted fly, right? Yeah, if you're hanging up that often, you just need to decrease your, your weight load or your, your, your rig, you know? Yeah. In, in a perfect world, when you're when you're doing things correctly with the right technique, you, your rig should be kind of like basically bouncing bottom and just kind of moving along in the current. If you're hanging up that often, it's probably not a jig problem, it's usually a weight problem. Yeah. Is there any advantage to a long nipping rod on a small stream? Say that again, Tom? Ed, Ed's asking, uh, is there any is there an advantage to a long nymphing rod on a small stream? So, it's a great question. In in short, go use as long as a rod as you possibly can. So, I mean, that is it. The longer the rod, the more line and leader control you have. I mean, so one of my first days I ever fished with my, with Joe, uh, was a really small mountain stream. And like, if you watch the movie, live the stream, like that inner, that, that beginning scene where he's in a, what he calls a little thicket, he's making this cast. That was the stream he showed. He took me to super tight. And when you look at the rod that he's fishing, it's a seven and a half foot rod. Joe does not fish a rod shorter than seven and a half feet, even in the tightest conditions. And he'll tell you, as long as you know how to control your loop and the, you know, how that loop comes off the rod tip, you can cast incredibly tight loops in, in, in tight spaces with longer rods. So I would say yes. I mean, depends on what you define as a small stream, but like the small streams here that I, I, I live in central Pennsylvania, usually I'm fishing rods anything from like nine, nine to 10 foot in length. I, I, I prefer to fish longer rods, but again, that longer rod just gives you more ability to hold line leader off the water. And the longer the rod you can, the easier your job presenting the fly is to the fish. Um, has some fly questions. One is, you know, what are your top three go-to flies? And then Amy is asking go-to flies. So you want to name some patterns that you would never go anywhere without? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there's no secrets. Yeah, I mean, it, it's there's a couple patterns. I mean, like right now, early spring has nothing to do with matching the hatch, but like an orange egg. I'm, I'm telling you, like in central Pennsylvania, like an orange or like a, a light pink egg. It's just, it catches fish. It doesn't matter if it's January or if it's early February. It is just a, one of my favorite patterns. The other pattern I, I do a lot, uh, I do really well with is Spencer Higa's SOS. I tie that in the traditional black and red, uh, but also when you're trying to do like sulfurs or like other mayflies, I'll do that like in a rusty brown color, like a brown color. Uh, I would say right there, the egg, the SOS pattern, 
And the other one is just variations of the, the waltz worm and like the sexy waltz worm. But my patterns have gotten simpler and simpler over time. And I, I would say, I would say this, the, the best, the best nymph anglers I know, the best competitive anglers I know over the years, they have basically what they cover first is to as confidence patterns. And usually they'll have like five or six patterns that they'll fish. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's in Eastern States, Western United States, or internationally, it's just like the same patterns. The only time I really think where you need to get really imitated is that when you have hatches, you know, like say hexagenia, uh, hexagenia, Eastern green drake, or isonachias, where you have insects that have very unique physical characteristics, characteristics, they're swimmers, they move, they're, those are the times where I think you maybe need to be a little more imitative and kind of matching the hatch, but for the most part, like a sexy waltz worm, something like that, in like three or four different shades. Same thing with the SOS pattern and like some egg patterns. I mean, that's, I could, as an instructor at Penn State, this is my first year teaching at Penn State. And for years I've complicated. And it's, it's, it's always one of those things where you're not always practicing what you preach. And I'm always stressing to my kids in the classroom how to keep things simple and not complicate things. So for like this season, this season I've been fishing, I've been fishing a handful of dry flies and nymphs, and that's all I've been taking with me on the stream, just trying to practice what I preach. And to be honest with you, I think there's been like one time of the like 60 days I fished this year where there was one time where I thought, damn it, I, I wish I would have brought my other fly box. So I have kept things really simple. And to be honest with you, I feel lighter and I feel more effective as an angler. Cool. Yeah, it's uh, as Kirk Dieter said on a conversation I had with him yesterday, nymph fishing is all about physics and not about fly patterns. Yeah, he hit the nail on the head. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, somebody asked me if I was a sativa or an indica guy, and I'm neither. <laughs> Those days are long past. Uh, do you put the, oh, the good, good question from Suzanne. Do you put the, your heaviest fly on the dropper or the point? Yeah, so everyone's, everyone's different. Uh, give me a second here. So I usually put it on the top or on the on the dropper, and the reason why. So I'm doing this. The thing you need to remember is, anytime you're putting a fly, get a black, a little darker. So I tend to put flies on the point, and, and when I do that, I just I just feel I am a horrible artist here, Tom. But when you put the flies on the dropper or on the point, it just keeps everything nice and tight. Okay. And anytime you add a dropper, even up a little bit higher, it still remains fairly tight. And the other thing about this is I try to, go, even when we talk about long leaders, I try to use as short of a leader as possible. And when you talk about your tippet length, how long the tippet needs to be from the cider down to your, your flies, a lot of it comes down to your, your anchor, where the most amount of weight is. Uh, and when you have the heavier fly or the heaviest amount of weight on your rig at the very point, you can shorten up this tippet section. If I have to, if I'm putting my heaviest fly on the middle dropper right here, and I fish my fly, this tippet is going to have to be significantly longer to compensate for the fact that my my my, my heavier my heavier fly is right here. Now here's the funny thing: like two of the guys who I who I, I cite all the time, Lance and Devin, um, you guys had a great video, of Modern Nymphing One and Two, and they just came out with a new one called Adaptive Fly Fishing. Lance fishes, last time I remember, he fishes all his flies, heaviest flies on the middle dropper and lighter weight fly in the point. Devin fishes his heaviest fly in the point. And you put those guys into the same situation, they're almost going to catch the same amount of fish each and every time. It's just personal preference. Mm -hmm. um, here's a good question. Uh, what kind of leader formula do you use? Lance wants to know, what kind of leader formula do you use when you're dry fly fishing with a Euro rig? Yeah, so I mean that, that's what this is right here. So like what I've been doing, and, and I tell you, this is the one thing when, when people talk about these European nymphing rods. What I think one of the biggest misconceptions about it is people think that's all you can do is nymph fish. These rods, in my opinion, are like the ultimate dry fly rod. And one of the things I've done not only with nymphing but also with dry fly fishing is just basically thinning out the entire line. So what I've been doing here on my system is off my my tactical nymphing line from say Orvis, I have four feet of 15 pound test max. So I have a tippet ring off this tippet ring. I'm going to do a level section, say uh, 12 inches of like two X. I might do 16 inches or so of like four X. 
And then I might have a section of like 24 to 30 inches of like 6X tippet. But what is so cool about these rods is that you can cast, you can literally cast these lines and light leaders 35, 40 feet away. And what is so cool about this, this is how geeked out, this is how geeked out I am, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> no worse than the rest of us, George. Yeah, but this is where like long lead, but the whole idea is you decrease surface tension, you're gonna increase the length of your drip. So yeah. this is what I've done, I've, I've had multiple rods cast in two hands. One with a Euro line like this with my leader formula, and then the other one with the traditional four weight fly line. And you make a cast, you put the flies in the same cast, both lines next to each other. I want to see that. Yeah, and the, the weight forward, four weight fly line, because that mass is sometimes two to three times the diameter, that drag is going to set in three to four times quicker than it was uh, with your Euro line. In this Euro line, you'll find that your drifts are going to last three, four, five times longer because it's going to take that much longer for that drag to set in to pull that, that those little S curves out of your, your leader. So when possible, again, I'm not fishing the wind river. I'm not fishing, you know, the, the Madison river in like windier conditions. I'm fishing smaller mountain streams or smaller spring creeks in PA where we kind of have some protection from the wind. But I have found that your dry fly presentations are actually phenomenally better with a lighter light line weight like this in a very basically paperless leader. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very interesting. Um, hi, George. As you know, old timers like Joe like to use a lot of split shot. I find it is harder to detect strikes. Can you share a technique to get your flies to the target zone in deep runs without split shot or large weighted flies? Yeah, we, we kind of already talked about that, but that's yeah. Like, but the whole thing is just decreasing tension. I mean, that's what it comes down to is the moment you begin leading the flies, you're putting that line under tension. So normally when you're casting, one of the things you can do is you can elevate the rod tip, basically managing the slack, decreasing the tension, but basically just elevating the rod tip to allow those flies to free fall. But the, the other thing you can do is just rely mostly on the line hand to cast. So what I mean by that is when you're when you're tight lining them, instead of casting and begin leading, we're just simply going to cast, point the rod tip straight at the fly, straight upstream. But instead of elevating or even moving the rod tip downstream, I'm going to point the rod tip at the flies and then just basically use nothing but the line hand to manage that slack. And that is a quick way to allow even the lightest weight flies to quickly plummet down to the bottom. Again, the last thing you want to do is put tension on those rigs. If you decrease tension on that line, you're going to allow even the lightest weight flies to plummet very fast down to the bottom. Can you Euro Nymph, my, Mahoney wants to know, can you Euro Nymph on a narrow stream that is approximately maybe 15 feet wide? If so, would... 10 foot rod, I think 10, 10 foot rod still be appropriate. Yeah, I mean, there's a, absolutely. I mean, as long as you have plenty of overhead, some overhead cover, but as long as you have, you know, 11, 12 feet ceiling between you and the, the trees, you definitely can. A lot of the streams I'm fishing, there's even smaller limestone streams that aren't as well known that are like six, seven feet wide uh, in tighter canopy. But I'm almost always, I would say 90% of the time here in, in my home waters, I'm fishing anything from like a 10 to a 10 and a half foot rod. But again, that's, that's just my personal preference. Uh, Mahoney asks, is there an Orvis video demonstrating how to build your own leader DIY leader building? Uh, yeah, there is a, there will be on Saturday on YouTube when the, when the uh, TV show comes out, George shows how to build a whole leader as he showed you with the little bunny ears in, um, in great detail shows you every step of the way. So, um, I don't want to ask you to do that here, but, um, you know, there's lots of detail, especially for those of you who are asking, you know, kind of general, broad, how do you get started questions? I'd recommend that you, what, that you watch the TV show. Uh, ah, here's a good one from Lori. How do I get a lightweight fly, like a midge to roll across the bottom of the stream? Yeah, it's, uh, again, the same the same idea. It's just decreasing tension. Uh, that That is the big thing. Uh, the other thing is really going lighter weight tippets. You know, a lot of times I'm fishing tippets 6 to 7x in diameter, and people think that's incredibly light. It is light, but when you have these soft direction fly rods, those soft direction fly rods really allow you to protect those lighter tippets. Uh, so, yeah, the big thing there is just, again, the same thing we talked about is just, decreasing the tension on that uh, the other thing too is 
there's only so much weight you can put into a fly. So if you're fishing like out west, you're fishing like the three dollar bridge area in Montana, I don't care how much how good the tungsten is, you can only put so much weight into that tungsten. So anytime you really need to roll the bottom on really fast, deep, turbulent waters, that is where I'm typically using like a drop shot rig, where I'm going to put all the split shot on the very end of my, my tip, usually where my point fly is. So what I mean by that, if you're not familiar with it, is that you're just going to, with your tip right here, I would do an overhand knot right here, right where my last fly, my point fly would be, do an overhand knot. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add several smaller split shot on that leader. That split shot is going to basically be bouncing bottom. That's basically my anchor. And then anywhere from like 8 to 12 inches above my, my split shot, I'm going to do a surgeon's knot or just a tippet knot where I'm going to add a very short section, maybe 5 or 6 inches of tippet, and just allow that lighter white fly to kind of suspend over the split shot. But the split shot's doing all the work. It's dredging while my lighter white fly just kind of stays hovered over the, 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 the shot. So that allows you to fish really lightly weight flies in really fast, turbulent, broken water. Uh, <laughs> your favorite nymph pattern. We kind of talked about that. Uh, what is the best time of year to nymph fish? This came in from Instagram. Yeah, it's usually whenever they're not rising. Uh, and that for me, that's <laughs> at the time. Uh, yeah. But yeah, nymphing is it's just nymphing is just probably really, uh, it's just, you know, by far the most effective tool uh, for like a lot of the spring creeks I fish, a lot of the, the pressured fisheries there. There's only a handful of days where I would say I have like epic dry fly fishing. So as much as I like to dry fly fish, if I don't feel like there's a really good opportunity to consistently catch fish on the surface, I'm going to nymph fish. And that's, that's probably like 90% of my season in all honesty. So just about mm -hmm. every time is going to be a good time to nymph fish. Hey, there's a good one from Dave. Uh, do you find that tying in hot spots behind the bead or on the tail improve traditional nymph patterns? I wouldn't say I wouldn't say improved. What I would say is it definitely adds another dimension of fish catching or kind of glare. You know, I would say like 2005, 2006, when I was first introduced to the Frenchie uh, from the French team on my competition, I was the first one like in central Pennsylvania fishing these hot spot flies, and it was fabulous now everyone they're in their brother and their sister are fishing these kind of these flashback you know gaudier you know hot spot patterns and they work but they don't work nearly as well i would find i mean those sp hot spots are still really good uh but usually i'm fishing more hot spots in like broken turbulent water just something or dirtier water where fish need uh need something easier to see and then the other time i use those hot spots often in the winter time when fish are just stagnant they're not as active and I just, i'm just looking for a little extra flash something to kind of get, get their attention uh but like a lot of times now during the season when we have low clear water i'm i'm fishing most of my traditional patterns i'm not using a lot of hot spots the thing i'm doing now to give it a little bit of uh, bling so to speak is just using like pearl tinsel like that sulky tinsel that you would use on a uh, on a sexy wall swarm and i i rib most of my mayfly nymphs or caddis nymphs with that but I don't do as many hot spots as, uh, as I've done in the past. Here's a good question from Jeff. I understand you've written a couple of books on these techniques. Which do you recommend reading first? Uh, in all honesty, I would say nymphing, the, the new one, and nymphing new angles and strategies. I tried to make this a more relaxed book. My, my first book, Tiny Nymphing, Nymphing, it is a dry textbook. I mean, it is like, it is a textbook uh, in very geek, geeked out terms. I would say <laughs> I would say that book is kind of like another level up. Uh, a lot of people who have read that or have read that book do not like it, especially from a beginner standpoint. So if you're getting into this sport, uh, this tight line nymphing, I would say that the, the latest book is going to probably be a much easier entry uh, into the world of nymph fish, nymph fishing from a from a literature standpoint. And some of you, it looks like you're quite geeky. I would recommend dynamic nymphing because it's got a lot of stuff in it. <laughs> um, uh, Jerry wants to know, what's a general, this is a really good question. What's a general rule of tippet length from ring in relation to water depth? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So it has something to do with water depth, but also a lot of it, in my opinion, has to come 
come from the, the aspect of where am I presenting the flies or how close can I get to the fish? So what I mean by that is if I'm fishing s smaller waters or water that's maybe broken and so forth, but I can basically stay on top of the fish and fish under the rod tip. My, my tip is, again, what we're trying to do is fish as vertical as possible. So my tippet length, what I'm doing is if I'm fishing, just guesstimating, if I'm fishing three foot of water, I'm going to add maybe four for the level to the below my cider because I'm anticipating I'm trying to keep the cider off the water the entire time. So in deeper water, I might have to lower a little bit, but for the most part, I'm keeping it off the water. That's when you're fishing directly under the rod tip. In low clear water, and you might only be fishing six or seven inches, but you, you can't get close to the fish. You are literally casting 25, 30 feet away. That angle, instead of going straight up and down where you can use a short tippet, that, you know, that lesser of an angle, that in that situation, your tippet sometimes, in order to keep that cider off the water and still present far away and keeping the line leader off the water, your tippet length might need to be six, seven, eight foot in length. Uh, so it really comes down to not only the depth, but more importantly, how far away you're presenting the flies. If, hopefully that answers your question. Great. Yeah, that was a great, that was a great question. A great answer. Um, Dave wants to know what size tippet ring do you normally use? They're, they come in three sizes, like small, medium, large or something. What size do you use? At least for my eyes right now. And from and what you need to understand is the fish I'm after in central PA, we do not grow really large fish on average. We do get some bigger fish, but I'm using the 2.2 millimeters and I, I'm going the extra small, the smallest ring possible because so often I am using my ring as a as on my leader as a dry fly tool. So if I'm using that larger ring, that larger ring is going to sink your leader uh, and it's going to increase the sinking rate of your leader if you're laying that on the water. So I really try to thin out my 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 tippet ring. If I'm fishing for steelhead and doing like, you know, big stuff like that, then I'm definitely going to go a little bit larger. But where I'm at, I go as small as possible. OK, great. Uh, let's see. Dave wants to know, for someone just starting out on a budget, would you recommend the clear water three weight or two weight outfit? Is there a clear water two weight? I don't think there is. is it? I know I, I know I've been proto testing one. Uh, <laughs> or I have one. Uh, of, uh, one of us should know, right? <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's a two weight uh, out there, at least at least it's in my hands. I'm not sure if it's on the market yet, but okay. Uh, again, we, we talked about this before, but the two weight is really, really nothing but a nymphing rod there's really it's so limp you can't really do anything other than just nymph fish if you're going to do some dry fly fishing and maybe think about nymphing as like 80 percent of your game and like 20 percent of your other game might be dry flies and indicators then do the three weight but if all you're going to do is fish for smaller fish with a tight line rig i would say the two weight would probably be a, a better option okay there's some people have here that have come late and they say you know they're asking questions you already answered this this um, discussion is going to be uh, published. Uh, just watch the Orvis uh, news blog, and um, we'll, and then the Orvis uh, uh, YouTube page, and we'll we'll run it again. So if you missed some stuff at the beginning, you can go back and watch it. Trying to look for something that hasn't been asked. Tim Johnson. Let's 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 see what Tim Johnson has to say. Also, when you connect the line to the bend of the lead fly, it's perfectly situated to pull the lead fly out of the fish's mouth. If the lower fly snags in anything during the fight, uh, good point, Tim. Thank you, Tim. How are you today? Oh, what about tying dropper off the eye of the top fly hook when using two nymphs? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. You can definitely do that uh, without a doubt. You're definitely uh, you're not going to have as much movement if you intend to swing in your flies. But if you're drifting yeah. flies, you can definitely tie off uh, off off the eye. And, and that, in all honesty, like those Orvis big eye flies, I think are fantastic for that. And I know one at one point, even like what I like about uh, you talk about like adjustable indicators. Um, and you're talking about like dry droppers. One of the things I like about the Orvis big eye flies is all you can do is you can just basically do a loop through the Orvis eyes and actually do a loop under itself. Uh, and then you can adjust the dry fly uh, on your leader, uh, act, you know, acting as an indicator. So I do use a lot of those Orvis big eye flies specifically for that purpose. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Roger Bird, hi Roger Bird, wants to know how do you organize your fly box by fly or by weight? And I know the answer to this. Sure. Yeah, we, we talk about this in the film, but definitely by weight. Uh, you know, I have some heavy stuff. I have some medium stuff. Uh, and this is all, to be honest with you, this is all like thousands and thousands of flies that I, 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 carry, I, I carry in my vehicle usually. Uh, but I have them all categorized to weight and speed sized. But when I'm fishing, I just take a handful of the flies I anticipate to fish in right here. But from an organizational standpoint, everything is like bead size, four, 3.5, three, and so on. So, And those those three big fly boxes you, that you just showed, you're going to send those to the person who asked the best question on, on today's Facebook Live, right? Exactly. I can't promise there's any flies in there, but yes. I'll <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see what else we have here. <clears throat> well, I got to read Michael's comment. Recon three weight, in my opinion, the best design rod on the market. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's yeah, nice to say so. And George, uh, George was involved in the design of that rod. I just say if the rod sucks or if it's good, that's it. Uh, those guys are fantastic. Uh, at, at the rod design. It's oh, here's a good. Yeah, go ahead. How do you handle a 20-inch fish on a two-weight rod? That's a good question. Uh, it's – I will say this. Some rods, some rods, when you look at these rods, like, for example, I know this is a two-weight rod. I don't, have my, I don't have my clear water rod. But the thing is, when you look at these rods, not all rods uh, – and, I, again, we're not naming names by anything, but – this is a, this is a three weight rod. But when you look at the butt section of this rod, this is actually like a five weight butt section. This rod has a three weight tip, and in some situations, like our recon, two weight, it has more like a four weight butt section and a two weight tip. But what I love about these rods is that these rods give you two levers. When you're playing a fish on bit light tippet, you're going to go vertical. You're going to use the, the tip of the rod to basically play the fish. But when you have heavier diameter tippets, say four or five x tippet, you're talking maybe five, six, seven pound test. Instead of using that tip of that rod, you're just basically going to keep the rod tip lower, bend the, but you're actually going to be playing the fish more with the four to five weight butt section. So what's cool about these rods, these rods give you two levers, the light tip, and then also when you really want to force and go into that, that power movement to land the fish, just lower the rod and actually play the fish with this part of the rod. And it's really hard with that light tip to break a tippet when you're playing a fish, unless the fish takes you into a snag or something. Correct. But it's you have to work really hard to, to break a tippet really? on those light rods. Correct. Uh, here's a good one. Have you ever used this, that spiral mono indicator? Yeah. I mean, I first wrote uh, Dynamic Nymphing years ago. This is 2009. But I was introduced to the spiral, the curly Q indicator back in 2006. It works, uh, but to be honest with you, it's very wind resistant. It's a great indicator, but floating that cider with these uh, vertical ears that we showed you before, I find is just as effective and it's a hell of a lot easier to cast than that spiral indicator. So that was something I used, you know, 10, 12 years ago, but now I've kind of just gone to floating the cider. How do you have a double screen? I don't know. What happens? Uh, what's your favorite dry fly rod for fishing long glides a non i guess a non-euro nymph question yeah so i think the rods i've been using right now is uh yeah yeah i mean i'm an orvis ambassador so what do you want me to say but it's uh i've been using a 10 foot you four the 10 foot four uh, h3 has been kind of my bread and butter and I've been using uh, just a mastery series double taper four weight uh, line on that. But that is like if I'm going to be dry fly fishing, if all I'm doing is going out dry fly fishing, that is my line and my my rod setup for sure. Here's a really good question. And I'd love to know this. What place do you fish that you are most challenged by and why? You know, I think. Or probably, George, you're not challenged by anything. I am I am challenged by a lot. And, and I think. <laughs> It's this is yeah, I think this is one of the best. And I think it goes over a lot of people's heads when people ask me for advice. But I think one of the things about competitive fly fishing that it forced me to do when I was competing is that when you fish a new environment, you have a whole new set of variables, unknowns that you have to kind of work your way through. 
Yeah. So in all honesty, it's fishing new familiar waters. Because for me, the way the cognition works between these two, these ears right here is when you fish a water body of water over day and day and out, you go on, I go on automatic pilot. I pretty much know where the fish are and I don't think whatsoever. So from a challenging standpoint is a lot of times it's, it's new, it's completely new water. And if I was to pick up maybe one stream that has offered me, probably given me the, the biggest fits, it would be, I would say the Latorte. Uh, it's that just... It's not like it was in the heyday, but it's this beautiful little spring creek that goes through just kind of this urban area. There's some wild areas, but this stream is a spring creek, which is sometimes, you know, very narrow, but it's got incredible velocity. It's got lots of vegetation. And because of that vegetation, it creates all these funky hydraulics. And you have these bigger fish that hold down deep, three, four feet down deep in between these hydraulics and amongst these weed beds. And I would say the Latorte has given me the most amount of fits. Like I would say, on a good day or a good situation, I might get one or two decent fish out of that uh, after a couple hours. So the Latorte has whipped me plenty of times. Here's a here's a good one. Um, how do you how do you kind of process what two flies to pick? What's going on in your head? Uh, I think that's what the what uh, John's question is. Uh, you know, how do you decide? Or what what rationale do you use for picking those two flies in combination? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of variables that can go in your mind, but the one thing is if you if fish hatch time is just talking to your local fly shop, but just what is hatching, what is what is active, what are the fish seeing? So that's going to be one. Like right now, there would like last week it would have been like random cast. Now they're still blueing olive uh, nymphs. Uh, Hendrickson's are starting to pop. So hatching right there. The other thing too is like. Are, are, what, what's the turbidity like? I mean, that's the big thing. Like you can have the perfect match to hatch situation, but if you have a, a, a weather event come in and pour water in there, all of a sudden your, your, your visibility goes from like 25 inches down to about six inches. All I'm looking for is a fly like a mop or a worm. That's something incredibly visible, gaudy, something that those fish can locate and, and pick from. Uh, the other thing too, is just the fly size itself. So, like typically, like when you look at spring creeks, tailwaters, on average, and I'm saying on average as a general rule, those insects, as you know, are, are typically smaller in size. When you go to like Rocky Mountain freestone streams, you're talking about larger stone flies and so forth. So you're going to be going with larger flies. So spring creeks, tailwaters, I'm often starting off with like size 16s, 18s on the Rocky Mountain freestone streams or the streams up, up north where I'm at. I'm often fishing like little miniature rubber sized stone fly patterns in like tens and twelves, uh, as just as a baseline to get started. Okay, we probably only have time for a couple more questions. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab some here. Oh, here's a good one. What's the difference between Euro line nymphing and check nymphing? <laughs> Same thing. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> years ago, I mean, yeah, Velotti is a friend of mine. Velotti is one of the first guys to kind of introduce the world to this short line nymphing strategy. But in my book, I'm Polish. I'm I'm 50 percent Polish, so we have like a bond right there. But because I mentioned Czech Pol Czech nymphing in, in my book, my first book, Velotti didn't speak to me for six months. So, but it's basically the same thing. One of the things you realize <laughs> is the Czechs and the Poles. They kind of start off with a very short line, heavily weighted fly system, whereas like the French and the Spanish were, were fishing usually scary or water where there were spookier fish, lower clear water. As a result, they were using longer leaders. So, but anymore today, all this stuff is basically put into one system and you're going to fish a long leader for like skinny water. You might use a short leader for very heavy, broken pocket water, but it's the same stuff. Um, I think I said, I might, I think I said in, in the video, there's no geography when it comes to net fishing anymore these days. Yep. Oh, here's a good one. Uh, I know that Tom doesn't, but from Suzanne, but do you ever use loop knots on your nymphs? I don't personally, uh, but I know some people who do. Uh, I would say the, the times who I, when I experimented, tried, I haven't given it a good shot is when I'm jigging streamers like little nymphs and I want to swing them. I think mm -hmm. that loop knot does give the fly a little bit more movement. I think, to be honest, what I do that when I, when I use the loop knot the most is, most is when I'm actually fishing terrestrials and ants and beetles. That's something I picked up from Gary LaFontaine's book years and years ago. 
But I find that when you see a hopper on the water, it just, when you use that loop knot, especially with those currents and that larger fly, it just gives the fly a larger terrestrial, more movement on the surface. So hmm. I use loop knots more with my larger dry flies than I do with nymphs and streamers. You know, I'm going to experiment more with loop knots on nymphs because they, they do wiggle so much. And I'm going to experiment with articulated nymphs too, you know, for the bigger, for the bigger stuff. Uh, what sort of water, Seth wants to know, what sort of water should I look for to really hone my tight line nymphing? In other words, probably where is it easiest to have some success? <laughs> I think, and I talked about this, I did an article for fly fishermen a number for last year, but I call it, it's called a pond life. But basically either go into a stream where there's stock fish, or there are some places like out West where you've got these high gradient streams where fish are going to just basically jump out of the woodwork and, and get your flies. So the whole, excuse me, the whole thing is the repetitive motion, but in all honesty, I think one of the reasons why my son, uh, Logan, he's nine now, but he started tight line nymphing at age uh, six and he's probably better at it now almost than I am. Uh, and I think one of the best things I did for him is actually taking him to ponds. So, Basically, your European nymphing rig that you like to use, take that to a pond and this jig for sunfish, panfish, any of those little things, you will get a couple hundred strikes at the end of the day. And because of that, when you're jigging, what you're doing, remember with lighter weight flies, you're just looking for that strike to occur. And with those panfish, you're going you're gonna to see hundreds of those fish hit your fly. And basically what you're doing is you're just training your brain to register that strike. And the more you see, the better you're able to register it. So mm. now Logan – since he has basically seen thousands of panfish hit and strike his cider and, and tighten up, he can go to a trout water and he just has that instinctual instinct to immediately set the hook on any pause. So just develop confidence. So stock waters, but honestly, if you have a if you have a warm water pond anywhere near your home, I think that is one of the best teachers uh, for yourself with this game. Yeah, that's a great tip. That's a great tip. Or find some place that's heavily stocked and the fish are stupid. <laughs> Uh, you know, George, we've gone for an hour and a half and Ooh, we, st yeah. we still got questions, but, um, I have another, I have something else to do and, and we probably should let you go. Cause I know you're a very busy guy these days. Staying busy, but yeah, teaching the classes, but, uh, staying as busy as I can, but you know, we can always maybe do a round two at some point down the road. If uh, I'd love to do that. Yeah, I'd love to do that. You said you just told me earlier you weren't going to do any more of these. Well, for you, Tom, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> well, George, I feel honored. I feel honored. Well, I, I want to thank you all for joining us. And um, and there were some great questions. And I know uh, that you guys learned a lot from George. I learned even more today than – or I learned as much today as I did doing the TV show with George. So um, – Thank you very much, George, for joining us. And thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in and giving us your time and your questions and your enthusiasm. Just uh, now, just go out there and have fun. Have fun. Exactly. And catch some fish. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. See ya.